It gives me great pleasure now to introduce to you um, Dr Liz Weeks, who um, is going to talk about um, one of the key sections that um, dietitians use about um, estimating energy requirements. Welcome, Liz. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the committee for asking me to talk about what we're doing with updating the... Ooh. They can hear me <laughs> about updating the um, energy, protein, and other requirements section of the guidelines of the um, pen handbook. What I'm going to do today is not give you the answers. What I'm going to do is tell you about where we've come from, where we've gone, and where we think we might be going. But you will have to wait until March 2018 to actually see what's going to be in the handbook regarding requirements, because we haven't finished yet. We are one of those three sections that have not yet submitted. But I think, hopefully, by the end of the presentation, you'll understand why. So I'm going to structure the talk by giving you some definitions that I think are quite important to consider when you're looking at um, particularly energy requirements. I'm going to talk about what the current guidelines say and the criticisms that we've had around that. I'm going to then talk about how we've updated the guidelines and why we've done it the way we have and give you some pointers as to what you might find in the handbook later on. But um, at the moment, there are no promises. So I'm going to start with definitions. So before you do anything with energy requirements, I think it's incredibly important to understand when you look at a paper um, that tells you that they're measuring energy expenditure what components of energy expenditure are actually reporting the data on, because it makes a huge difference in how you interpret what you see. So the three main components are basal metabolic rate, which is between 60 and 70% of anyone's total energy expenditure. It's highly reproducible within individuals, so I know I've had mine measured several times, and mine's about 1,450 calories per day. But you do get 5 to 10% variation between individuals due to variability in their body composition, their age, and differences in proportions of metabolically active tissues and organs. You also get some variation due to thyroid function. And certainly if you look in a lot of um, notes of older people, there's a huge amount of um, hypo and hyperthyroidism going on. And also, your variation in energy expenditure is diurnal. You know, at night when you're asleep, your energy expenditure is lower than your BMR. The next component of energy expenditure is dietary-induced thermogenesis, which is generally taken to be around about 10% of um, your um, uh, requirements, of your total energy expenditure per day. Um, but that's assuming that you're eating a mixed meal. If you're eating a high-protein diet, or particularly high-protein diet, it might be higher than that. But if you're eating a mixed diet, it's likely to be about 10%. So physical activity, um, that's the most variable component of an individual's um, energy expenditure. And it can vary from as high as, um, um, from as low as, sorry, as about 10 or 20% of um, total energy expenditure in someone who's lying down or in hospital, not moving around very much, to uh, fairly unusually somebody getting 50, 60, 70 or 80% above to, um, resting energy expenditure, depending on how physically active they are. I think they say the general population in the UK is um, about 50% uh, above um, measured energy expenditure, BMR. So we're a relatively sedentary population. The first thing I'd like to say, though, is that measured energy expenditure, as reported in a paper, may not necessarily represent the actual requirements of the population that they tend to report about. And I want to explain why this is. So in health, um, I've explained what the components of energy expenditure. The same components are there in um, disease. But in disease, when you measure resting energy expenditure, and that has to comply with very strict conditions for it to be called resting energy expenditure, what has to happen is the person has to be lying still at physical and mental rest, not asleep, relaxed, and they have to have had no... Um, uh, extreme physical activity the day before, no alcohol, no stimulants, and they should have been fasted for at least 8 to 10 hours, and ideally 12 hours. So if you fulfill all those components, you're likely to get a measurement that's as close to basal metabolic rate as possible. But when you're measuring someone in the clinical setting, what you're also measuring at that time is any, amount, any effect of stress. 
So resting energy expenditure in the clinical setting may have, has to comply with all the um, components that you need for BMR, but what you're actually capturing there is the BMR plus the effect of any stress that might be present. So that is a very important thing to remember and to take away with for the rest of the talk. You might also then um, be measuring um, dietary-induced thermogenesis if the patient isn't properly fasted before the measurement has been undertaken. And, and if the person is agitated or um, unable to lie still, you might even also be including a component of activity. So when you look at studies measuring energy expenditure in the clinical setting, it's extremely important to look at how they measured it and under what conditions the resting energy expenditure was measured and how long they waited for people to be resting and whether they were properly fasted or not. So in terms of measuring energy expenditure, um, in the clinical setting, although we very rarely see it in the UK, um, indirect cal calorimetry is the best way to do it. Um, measures oxygen consumption, and the best ones also measure CO2 production. It provides you with a respiratory quotient and, an est and a measured energy expenditure. And if you fulfill all the components that I described earlier, you will get BMR, or very close to BMR, or resting energy expenditure, including um, some component of stress, if that's present. They are for short-term measurements only. The longest I've ever managed to measure anyone is for 24 hours, because they do have to lie under a hood, or if they're on a ventilator, it's plugged into the ventilator, so it's slightly easier to um, measure them for longer periods of time. Um, but the very important thing about um, reviewing papers that do use this method is to see whether they established a steady state. And what that means is that their resting energy expenditure didn't vary by more than 5% either way. And if you see that, that means that it's been done under very good resting conditions. If you wanted to measure total energy expenditure, um, you would use doubly labelled water technique. And this is done for longer term measurements. You can measure people for up to two weeks. But um, in the clinical setting, I don't think I've ever seen it used, although it is used in a few um, clinical studies um, in long-term conditions, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later. But what that gives you is total energy expenditure, but on its own, it doesn't tell you how much of that is resting, how much of that is stress, or how much of that is DIT, or how much of that is physical activity. It just gives you a total energy expenditure over the time period that you um, measured it. So usually the best studies will use to, uh, doubly labelled water to get an indication of total energy expenditure and indirect calorimetry to get an indication of how much of that total energy expenditure is resting or BMR and stress. And increasingly now we're seeing the use of accelerometers or multi-sensor systems for measuring, directly measuring physical activity. It's still relatively rare in the clinical setting, but we did find a few. Um, and if you use all three methods together, you then get a very good indication of what someone's um, energy expenditure is and what each component contributes to their total energy expenditure. So I'm now just going to talk quite briefly about current practice and the criticisms of what we did in the past. So in the clinical setting, there are four, I think there are four main methods for estimating requirements. Because when you look at an individual patient, um, you have got to decide whether their requirements are the same as, more than, or less than what they would be if they were healthy. Yeah? And actually by standing and looking at a patient, it's sometimes very difficult to do that. And if you're measuring energy expenditure with indirect cal calorimetry, you will get resting energy expenditure for that patient, but you won't get physical activity or DIT. So you will have to consider, make a clinical judgment about what that should be. But because so few of us have indirect calorimetry available, we tend to use one of three methods, and I'm going to talk about each of them in a bit of detail and some of the criticisms of them. So I'll talk first about the factorial method, which is what we put into the PENG guidelines. I'll talk briefly about regression equations and also rule of thumb, thumb criteria as well. But before we start, we need to think about what actually affects energy requirements in the disease. Quite apart from when you're, when you're healthy, your age, your gender, your weight, your body composition affect your resting or energy expenditure or your BMR. But when someone is sick, there are all these other things we need to be thinking about. What type of illness they have? Is it acute or chronic? 
Are they in a catabolic, anabolic, or normabolic state? Are they in the um, acute phase or the recovery phase? What's their nutritional status? Um, what kind of interventions they're having and are they likely to affect their requirements? How physically active are they and are they in any pain or do they have any disabilities that will affect their efficiency of activity, which might have an impact? Um, what's their psychological state? And actually the aims and likely duration of nutritional support. If you're going to provide nutritional support for only a week or two, your ballpark figure of estimating requirements may not be quite so important to be accurate as it would be if you're feeding someone for 3, 6, 12, 19 months or something like that. But we still have to think about how long we're going to feed that person. So I've been involved with writing this chapter of the handbook, we've realised today, for 20 years. I was actually involved in the 1997 edition. And at the time, I had been lecturing on energy requirements for the clinical update for about five years. I had spent a little bit of time working with uh, Professor Elia at the Dunn Centre in Cambridge and done some energy requirements work for myself on uh, patients with head injuries and patients with stroke. And I realised, sad that I am, I had a real passion for it. Um, so when I was asked if I would like to write that chapter, I said yes I would. And I did what I did at that time because I was a relatively inexperienced dietitian and I looked at the literature and I wrote a review and I thought, great, here it is. A few years later, Claire Soulsby joined me um, and together we updated it for the next edition in 2000 and whenever it was, <laughs> 1997, I can't remember which way. Um, and we did the same thing, but we added new sections as, um, re as um, Vera has already told us. But the underlying principle of what we did in 2011 and what we've done all the way along is we've used basal metabolic rate um, equations derived for healthy populations and we've asked dietitians to adjust them for the illness of an individual. And there are two important words there, populations, healthy populations, sick individuals. Not the same thing at all. But at that time, that's what we thought was the best thing to do. And you probably, some of you might remember the um, flurry of concern when we swapped Schofield for Henry. And then we suggested you added for metabolic stress. Um, and then an activity factor and a DIT factor, and some question about whether you should add or subtract up to 500 calories for weight change. So it's a, it's a method that we're all very familiar with. However, there have been some very valid um, criticisms of that approach. The first thing to uh, recognise is that basal metabolic rate equations, as I've said already, were derived from and for healthy populations and not for sick individuals. The majority of the clinical studies, if you go back and look at them, um, actually compare um, resting energy expenditure in clinical settings with the Harris-Benedict equations. Okay? And when we changed to Henry, we were not actually comparing like with like. Um, and in some of the more recent studies, they've compared um, um, resting energy expenditure with Schofield or mifflin Jour, which you might have heard about. So, okay. We've used slightly different equations for the BMR equations. What difference does that make and why is that important? Well, the data on Harris-Benedict equations were actually collected from the, uh, over 100 years ago. Okay? The population was a young population. The mean age was in the le um, uh, late 20s to early 30s. And the mean BMI was 21.5. Um, so they were a young, slim population, very, very unrepresentative of what we see today in the general population and what we see in the clinical setting. Um, and there's been, there were quite a few papers that came out in the 80s that criticised the Harris-Benedict equations for those reasons and showed that the accuracy in healthy adults varied by as much as plus minus 15%. And actually, they criticised the methodology of Harris-Benedict because what they did is they didn't fully comply with the requirements that you need to measure BMR uh, rather than resting energy expenditure. So I think you can have a look at these pictures. Um, the picture on the top is um, my relatives in the 1930s, and that's a more recent population. We're not the same as we were 100 years ago.
So when the first, uh, the, uh, the first um, handbook came out, we were using the Schofield equations, and they were developed in the 1980s as a result of the criticism of the Harris-Benedict equations. And they were a database of 114 studies with over 7,000 subjects. But again, they did include the Harris-Benedict data, but you can see there were um, a greater proportion of men, 67% versus 33%. And it was very heavily influenced by um, data from uh, Northern Europe and American populations, and particularly Italian populations. And maybe Bruno can tell us why that is. And there were very few subjects from other ethnic groups. Um, it was actually at that time the, the best review of um, BMR prediction equations. Um, and it was used by the COMA in 1991, the recommendations then, and the World Health Organization used it as its basis for um, estimating BMR in healthy populations. But then early in this century, <coughs> uh, J. Henry Oxford Brooks, because he felt that uh, the Schofield equations still didn't represent um, the, uh, the requirements, the BMR of healthy populations, he did a very thorough and very extensive review, and he looked at over 10,000 BMR values, looking at studies from 1914 to 2005. And he only included studies where the measurement conditions were strictly followed those required for measuring BMR. There was a, a much more equal proportion of men to women and a higher proportion of ethnic minorities and a higher proportion of elderly people. But if you can see there, it's still only 8% of that population were older people over the age of 65. And he excluded some of the Italian data because it was found that the Italian data was um, giving um, unusually high um, energy expenditures because it included very, very fit um, young men, a lot of fit young men, mostly in the military, but also doing very hard labor jobs like coal mining. Um, he also excluded uh, measurements that were done in malnourished or sick individuals and outliers like Burmese hill dwellers. And as a result of this review, um, the, the equations were generated and in 2011, the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition recommended the use of um, the Henry equations for healthy populations. And it was because of that that Claire and I thought we should use it in the PENG guidelines. However, we've been criticized for doing that, and going back to look at it now, I can understand the criticisms, and I'm an old dog, but I can be taught new tricks, so I am going back to look at uh, this in a different way. The other reasons we have been um, criticized in the PEND recommendations is when we include the table with stress factors, if you look at them carefully, there is a wide range of stress factors sometimes reported in the same condition. And um, it has been reported to us that some dietitians um, will use very high stress factors when it possibly may not be appropriate and could in fact be detrimental to a patient's outcome. And one of the things I think people may not have always noticed is that in the text we do say always start at the lower end of the stress factor, monitor and then adjust if necessary. But I do sometimes get um, students coming up to me and telling me what's in the pen handbook about stress factors and telling me very firmly that it says 40% and I'm thinking, I wrote that section, I don't believe that. <laughs> but I don't say that to them. Um, I think the important thing to remember is when you're looking at stress factors, and I am going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, you have to know the papers that you're getting the stress factors from. Review them really carefully because it depends on where in a patient's um, journey and their recovery from illness or not, they are. Um, what I would say, for example, is someone who's measured here, that's going to be a very high stress factor, but if they were measured there or there, it's going to be very different. And you need to know when you look at a paper where in that person's journey they were measured to be able to apply that to your particular patient. The other thing we've been criticized for is using static variables such as weight, which obviously in the clinical setting can be inaccurate or a guesstimate. And the use of the factorial method doesn't allow you to um, reflect changes in body physiology such as respiratory rate or temperature, which in a clinical, um, in an ITU might change very rapidly and might affect a person's requirements. <coughs> 
So those are all very valid criticisms of what we did. So I'm going to use this gentleman as um, an example of some of the things that I've pulled out so far. So he's a 70-year-old male, 65 kilos, BMI of 20. He's the sort of person I see all the time and have done research on in the past. He's been hospitalized with an acute exacerbation of COPD day five, and he's going to be discharged today. What are you going to give him? Well, what I wanted to do with this bit was just compare what you would get if you used Harris-Benedict equation, the Schofield equation, or the Henry equation as the basis for your estimate. So I've got basal metabolic rate calculated by each of those three methods. Then I've added a 10% stress factor, which you can argue with or not, but I'm not prepared to do that right this minute, and a 20% physical activity and DIT factor. So basically, it's 30% above BMR for each of those. And actually, despite the fact that you've used three different equations from three very different populations, the estimate, the total estimate at the end is between 1,800 and 1,950 calories, 150 calorie difference. What would you do in clinical practice with that person? Give them 1,800 calories, give them 19, give them 1,732, which some people tell me. I'd probably give them 2,000 and see what happens, yeah? But it's giving you a ballpark figure. And the one thing I want to say about energy requirements is estimates are estimates. They're a ballpark figure. The important point is to monitor whether what you're giving them is um, resulting in the change that you need or want to see. So that's the difference between the three of those equations as a, used as a BMR thing. So I'm now going to talk about disease-specific regression equations. Um, and these have been divided, they're usually devised um, in specific populations, most often in intensive care. And what, how they are done is that um, a, a research group will measure with indirect calorimetry, usually, um, the energy expenditure of a population, a defined population, and then they will use various components or par parameters of clinical status, um, age, gender, and that sort of thing, and de generate a regression equation that they feel is relevant and accurate for that population. Then the best studies will also apply that equation to a separate new group prospectively to see how much the um, regression equation agrees with measured energy expenditure in a separate population. So the best regression equations have been um, generated in a very strictly defined population. Um, and when you read the paper, you will know what that population is. And it will then have been tested in a similar population, which means that it can't be applied to a population that's not like that. So if you've done your, generated your regression equation in Burns patients who are obese in ITU and ventilated, like the Iton Jones ones, that's who that, reg that regression equation should be used in. It shouldn't be used in other populations. Um, and as I said before, most of the regression equations have been generated in intensive care settings, but there are increasingly a few more coming through in other conditions. And as part of our um, uh, searches, we found um, a few in um, COPD and in cardiac disease, and this one in rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. And I think this one's particularly interesting because it picks up on fat-free mass and CRP as an indicator of stress. And these, um, particularly CRP, was a very strong predictor of um, resting energy expenditure in people with rheumatoid arthritis in this particular population. So it's something we need to be starting to think about. But like all the methods that we have, disease-specific regression equations are open to criticism. At the moment, there are no guidelines on how frequently you should review the requirements of a patient and amend them in the light of physiological changes. So for example, if you have a patient in intensive care whose temperature and heart rate are going up and down within 24, 48 hours, are you going to tweak your feeding regimen that often? Or how often should you tweak it to make a possible difference to their outcome. And we haven't had any studies, or very few studies so far, that have actually done that yet, and showed that tweaking requirements to those particular parameters over certain time periods will make a difference to outcome. And we need those studies, I think, um, before we go too far. 
Similarly, if they haven't been validated in the same population in which they were derived, then they are open to criticism. And with all of the methods that we've got, um, they may be very good for groups or for populations, but when you apply them to the individual, they are not necessarily very accurate. So the next method I'm going to discuss is the rule of thumb method, um, which is based on energy values per kilogram body weight or fat-free mass or lean body mass. And you will see these a lot in guideline documents. Yeah? Increasingly, you're seeing them in ESPEN. They were in NICE and they're in ASPEN guidelines. And so I've picked out the NICE guideline is 25 to 35 cows per kilogram body weight for a stable, not too stressed, not per, uh, person not requiring, um, not at risk of refeeding syndrome. Okay? And the Aspen one is for a similar population. Um, the rule of thumb formally were originally derived as far as we can tell for ICU patients again and for patients on parental nutrition. But at the moment, neither Claire nor I, and in part of our searches, we've never found any original work for actually explaining how those values were derived or how they were validated. Um, I think the main difficulty I have with this particular method is that is a very wide range, isn't it? Between 20 to 35 calories per kilogram body weight. And where do we decide to give someone 20, 25, 30 or 35? There are no criteria for that. It's a guesstimate, it's clinical judgment. And as I've said before, there are no validation studies that we've been able to step to find that actually um, uh, have been done in the rule of thumb formulae. The other criticisms are that um, when you look at a rule of thumb formula, you need to know whether that applies to, whether it applies to resting energy expenditure or total energy expenditure. I would assume that at 20 calories per kilogram body weight, it should be resting energy expenditure. At 35, it might be total, but you need to look at the original data to find out. It's also very unclear, and the debate is still out, as to whether if you're using these um, types, of, types of formulae in people who are obese or very thin, uh, whether requirements should be calculated using their actual or ideal body weight or an adjustment like 25% or 50%. And I think the debate is still out on that. We tend to say use actual body weight at Penn Group, um, and we haven't done that obesity section yet, so we don't know what we're gonna say um, in the handbook at the end. The other thing to think about, though, is if you use the rule of thumb formulae, you haven't worked through necessarily where that, where that patient is in their pathway, um, and it doesn't account for any impact of age, gender, or metabolic state, okay? So the, um, the effect it might have on how you estimate requirements, so if you use the factorial method in that person I described earlier, the 70-year-old man with COPD, the uh, PEN guidelines would give you an estimate of around about 1,900 calories. The um, NICE guidelines would give you an estimate of between 1,600 and 2,300 nearly. Um, the Aspen guidelines would start even lower at 1,300 and go up to 2,200 and 76, and the, um, I, we found a um, COPD-specific regression equation, and that gives you an estimate of about 1,700. So the range is enormous. So clinical judgment is really important in deciding where you start. So I want to just summarize this bit by saying all prediction methods are open to criticism. Any one of them may over or underestimate someone's requirements. They are all, at the moment, pretty poorly validated. And while for groups of populations of specific conditions at specific ages and body compositions, they might be accurate, for, they have a very poor predictive value for individuals. And they are open to misinterpretation and, if not used carefully, can have the potential for clinical consequences for patients. So I'm going to now talk about updating the guidelines. So as I mentioned before, 20 years ago, I was a new and fairly inexperienced dietitian and um, at that time knew nothing about um, systematic reviews or guideline development. Um, to be fair to me, I think it was all a fairly new thing then anyway in clinical settings, um, but um, 
we did not apply um, the rigour that we now apply to reviewing the literature that's been published. So when I was asked if we would update the guidelines with Claire, um, I, I have had about 10 years experience now doing Cochrane reviews and more recently I've been involved in some ESPEN guideline development and I wanted to apply that knowledge to the estimation of energy requirements and um, Penn Group very kindly said yes we could do it so that's what we're doing. So I just want to remind you a guideline is intended to assist a provider of care to make an informed decision but the important point is the one at the bottom it's based on the best available evidence. If there isn't any evidence or the evidence is very poor, the guidelines are going to be very poor. So the one thing I would say about guidelines is they are as open to criticism as any other publication is, whether it's a randomized controlled trial, a systematic review, an observational study or a case report. A guideline is open to a criticism just the same. So what is the best available evidence? Well, you've probably all seen a similar pyramid to this. Ideally, a good quality, well-designed, well-carried out systematic review is the best available evidence. And we go all the way down to the bottom to expert opinion and editorials. I'm going to put my hands up and say, for the last 20 years, we've done expert opinion and editorials on the Penge Handbook um, for our section. We're hoping to go to the top with this aversion. So the process is actually quite long-winded. That's why it's taken us so long to do it. You have to find a group of people who are willing and able and have the time and don't have a life to actually join in the group. And Bruno will tell you all about that. Um, you define the scope of the requirement, the, the guideline that you're going to develop. You consider who else needs to think to read it. And then you generate your questions. Um, you do your searches. You pull out all the evidence, summarize it, and then the very important thing you do then is you make your recommendations and you make a, and you make a statement about the strength and the quality of your recommendations. Is the evidence that you're presenting well-conducted, robust, and scientific, or is it a bit iffy? And if it's a bit iffy, you say so, okay? If it's good quality, you say so. The strength of your recommendation will be guided by the quality of the evidence. So what we've done is um, we've bitten off more than we can chew and we did five systematic reviews for energy requirements and we're doing the meta-analyses at the moment and I'll explain what that means in a minute. So we've left ourselves very much less time to do protein, fluid, electrolytes and micronutrients. So we're actually doing a systematic review of published guidelines in these areas. Um, and we will present those findings as well in the handbook. So I'm going to tell you how we've done the energy one. So the first thing is the underlying principle of what we've done has changed radically. As I said before, what we've done before is we've said we are basing the estimation on requ of requirements on BMR equations for healthier populations and adjusting it for people who are ill. What we're doing this time is we are only using data generated in clinical settings. We are only using data where the, the methods that they used were validated and that the studies that they undertook were undertaken in a rigorous, as rigorous way as possible in a clinical setting. So we've mainly been looking for studies where they've done indirect calorimetry um, and doubly labelled water in clinical settings and if they've used validated activity monitors for physical activity. Ideally, we've been looking for studies where they've compared the sick population with healthy controls, um, although we have found an awful lot of studies where there's just the sick population. And what we've also done is we've paid particular attention to information that's in the studies about factors that might impact on the patient's requirements, such as gender, age, weight, and body composition, but also potential indicators of uh, metabolic state, whether they're acutely or chronically unwell, or whether they're stable, or whether they're in the anabolic state. And so this is the process. Uh, we started actually just a year ago, had our first meeting, um, and we've had four meetings since then. And in between each of those meetings, everyone's um, worked at these various tasks. So we 
defined the selection criteria, what we were looking for. We defined the search terms, and that's something that you do with a librarian who's familiar with looking at um, systematic reviews. We selected five databases to, 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 to search, the Cochrane Library, Medline, Embase, Web of Science, and Sinal. And the best systematic reviews and the best guidelines always do at least two databases. So if you see one that's only done one, it's no good. We then have um, Danielle Judges, who's been working with us as the research assistant, conducted all the searches for us in January. And then between January and June, um, we looked at all the titles and the abstracts that she picked up. And every one of those had to be looked at by two different people because that is the robust methodology for doing a guideline or a systematic review. So it's not one person's opinion, it's two. And if they disagreed, we would have a third person make a decision on that. So we did double review of titles and abstracts, and then when we pulled out the potential papers, we did double data extraction. What that means is we took out the data individually, two of us, that was relevant to, to the study, um, so that we could compare and make sure we've got every single bit of information that we actually need. We are just finishing that bit and pulling it all together. And what we're doing at the moment is putting the data into a, um, a review manager database, which will help us do a meta-analysis if we can. Um, and when we've done that, we'll make our recommendations and the strength of our recommendations, and then we'll be sending it out for peer review. And um, hopefully, the peer review will come back on the 2nd of January, and we'll have it ready to submit for the 8th. So what questions did we ask? Well, we actually made it very simple for ourselves. We thought, we thought, we thought we would ask five questions. We thought, because it seems that hypermetabolism is the thing that happens when someone's acutely unwell, and is the source of the, what we might call raised energy expenditure. We wanted to focus on people who are hypermetabolic versus people who are not hypermetabolic. So the five questions are around whether, what are the requirements of hypermetabolic adult patients? What are the requirements of metabolically stable adult patients? And then we wanted to look at the same things but at extremes of the BMI. So BMI less than 18.5 and greater than 30. And because we get asked about this a lot, or at least I do, we also put in a separate question looking at what are the requirements of long-term artificially fed patients. And we were particularly keen to look at those who have neuromuscular disorders because it seems there's a, a growing evidence base that their requirements are much lower than you might expect. So we're specifically looking at that. So we put a lot of emphasis on looking at hypermetabolism. But what does that mean and how do you define it? Well, when you look at the papers, it's defined pragmatically, usually, as 110% or 10% above basal metabolic rate as predicted by either Harris Benedict or Schofield or something like that. But that's a very pragmatic um, way of looking at it. What the studies often don't do is they'll tell you how many of the population were hypermetabolic but they won't present you the results in the hypermetabolic ones and the non-hypermetabolic ones. They'll just present you the results for the whole population. So you won't necessarily know what the requirements are of the hypermetabolic ones are versus the ones who are normal metabolic in a particular study. The other thing is, um, we don't always know, excuse me, <coughs> how long hypermetabolism lasts, whether in the acute setting or if someone's got chronic inflammatory response, for example, with COPD or congestive cardiac failure, does that only become evident and at a low rate for three or four months after an acute exacerbation, or is it there all the time? There are very few studies that tell us that. And so the question is, when you're looking at your patient, how do you know if they're hypermetabolic or not? Um, and we, in the last two versions of the handbook, have given some pointers, um, and we've said that stress response, someone who's likely to be hypermetabolic, will have a high temperature, but if they're being treated by um, antipyretics, they won't have a high temperature. A raised white cell count, an elevated CRP, um, uh, raised urea and low serum albumin, or they might be hyperglycemic. So any one of those might indicate that someone is metabolically stressed. 
What we're particularly doing when we're pulling the data out is looking to see if there are any studies that have looked at those particular parameters and correlated them exactly with metabolic rate. So just to show you how we design a question, we do, when you do a systematic review or a guideline, you do what's called a PICO question. So you define your population, which is the P. You define your intervention or what you're looking at, which is um, energy expenditure. You um, define the comparison. So we were looking particularly to compare with healthy controls, but we found quite a lot of studies where they compared patients with one particular illness, for example, cancer of the GI tract, and they compared them with people who had GI problems but not cancer. So it's very varied comparisons. And we wanted to see if, if you could get studies where they would measure different levels of energy, expen uh, energy provision and outcome, whether if you give someone 1,500 calories a day versus 2,000 calories a day in a particular um, condition, which one has the better outcome. But we haven't found any of those. There are a few in ICU, but we haven't found them generally. So we searched five databases, um, and we've also looked for relevant guidelines and systematic reviews. We've included only human studies, although um, a lot of, well, a few of the studies came up with rats and guinea pigs and trout, <laughs> various things, even though we put in terms to get, take them out. We put no limits on the dates, so we went back as far as we could, which included Harris Benedict, no limits on language, and no limits on the type of study. So we made it as broad as we possibly could. We've also had Danny doing hand searching of reference lists of systematic reviews and trials, and looking at the gray literature, such as published abstracts in um, uh, conference proceedings. And at the moment, we are pulling it all together, and the quality of each study that we include will be assessed using a formal process called the grade process, which I won't go into now, but if anyone's interested, I can explain it to you. So what we did is we had um, defined inclusion and exclusion criteria. So the inclusion criteria, resting energy expenditure measured by indirect calorimetry, and there's one other method that we, we've looked at as well, but I'll tell you about that later. Um, total energy expenditure measured by doubly labelled water or the bicarbonate method. And we've looked at uh, if there's possible uh, that they've measured physical activity. We've only looked at clinical settings and we've made a decision that the conditions that we will include have to have the potential to require nutritional support. Because when we did the search, we actually found we had an awful lot of studies that came up in people who... Ordinarily, as a dietitian working in nutritional support, you wouldn't necessarily see. So um, there were a lot of people with um, pre-obesity surgery, um, and there were a lot of people with um, things like Prader-Willi syndrome or Goucher's disease, sort of um, syndromes where obesity was a, an issue. And we made the decision that we would exclude those sorts of studies because we didn't think they were applicable to the audience, which is you. We also excluded handheld devices for measuring energy expenditure because they're not fully validated. We excluded mechanically ventilated patients because we knew that the intensive care um, group were writing a section on that and we didn't want to have to look at all that literature as well. Um, we also excluded anorexia nervosa unless it was part of a specific refeeding um, um, trial. And we did include post-obesity surgery if it was up to three months post-surgery because we felt that in, there's a possibility there that someone might require nutritional support after their obesity surgery if it doesn't go well. So we did include those. And what we've also done is we've not excluded HIV studies. What we've excluded are studies which were pre-antiretroviral um, treatments because people's outcomes and their body composition and everything have changed so much since then that we thought that those studies would be inappropriate. So what we found is we got 43,664 titles and abstracts that we all looked at, and that took us quite a long time. Um, but from those 43,000, we had just over 1,000 original papers that we double looked at, everybody looked at. And we've excluded just over half of them for mainly for the reasons that either that actually when we looked at it more closely didn't actually measure energy expenditure. Quite a lot of studies um, say they've measured energy expenditure and then what they've done is they've predicted it 
or they've used a BIA machine, a bioelectrical impedance machine, which has its own algorithm in there, and they've reported that as measured energy expenditure, which it isn't. We excluded studies in children, and obviously we excluded studies where we've made a decision already to exclude, like the mechanically ventilated. And what we've got is four groups of studies. We've got um, 36 systematic reviews and meta-analyses. We've got 190 studies with a control group, 263 studies with no control group, and we've got 14 studies that actually require translation. We haven't got all of those done yet. Um, and uh, or we can't actually access them even through all our library resources. And we've, what we've tried to concentrate on are the studies with control groups and fasted patients, because that's the most fundamentally rigorous way of looking at the data. So what you're getting with that is resting energy expenditure measurements. So the study populations are very varied. We've, had, uh, we've got studies in more than 30 different disease states. The majority of them, by far, measure, um, report resting energy expenditure, and they're in lot, quite a few different um, settings, hospital, outpatient, and rehabilitation, both inpatient rehabilitation, which they do with COPD in, um, in the Netherlands and other European countries, and outpatient rehabilitation, and we've included nursing homes. Um, one thing that we've been quite disappointed by is um, the high proportion that haven't reported the weight or the gender or the BMI or the nutritional status of the population that they're measuring, all of which have a significant impact on your requirements. Um, and very few of them have reported clinical parameters that might indicate the metabolic state of the patient. So we're going to be summarizing that data, but just being aware that even though we've looked at 45,000, it's actually only going to be one or 200 papers that we're going to be able to use. But one big thing we've had a difficulty with is the multitude of ways that people report energy expenditure. You would imagine that you would just find cows per day, yeah? No. You find resting energy expenditure in cows per day, megajoules per day, or kilocals per day. You find resting energy expenditure in cows per kilogram body weight. Um, megajoules per kilogram body weight, kilojoules per kilogram body weight. You can find it per day, per minute, per hour. So we've actually generated a database of all the ways we've found it, and it goes, I think there's something like 20 different ways we've found energy expenditure reported. Um, and that's just resting energy expenditure and total energy expenditure. We've also had predicted energy expenditure in cows per day, cal kilojoules per day, megajoules per day, and percentage predicted. The vast majority being Harris Benedict, but not all of them. And also, even physical activity has been measured in three different ways, or reported in three different ways. Often it's reported as a ratio between total and resting energy expenditure, um, or it might have been actually measured in calories, or it might have been actually reported in METs. So there's a huge variation there. And I just want to present a few slides of some work I've done in COPD before this, just to give you a feel for some of the things that we're going to see. So in COPD, I, we have 36 trials at the moment, and they were, took place between 1989 and 2015. And the sample sizes are very, very variable, from as little as six, how representative is that, to about 100. Um, across all these trials, because it's a COPD group, they all tend to be fairly consistent in terms of age, body mass index, and FEV1, which is a measure of severity of illness. And that is sort of m severe to moderately severe um, um, FEV1 that represents. And in this particular um, group of trials, we had 19 that reported resting energy expenditure in cows per day. And roughly, it came out at about 1,400 calories a day. We had 11 trials that reported resting energy expenditure as percent of Harris Benedict, and it came out roughly as 14% above. Um, we have nine trials that reported totally en total energy expenditure, and it came out roughly 1,900 calories. And we even had, in this particular cohort, six trials that looked at physical activity, and with a mean PAL of about 1.5, which shows they were pretty um, sedentary as outpatients. So that's how we might report some of this stuff. Not that you're going to have to look at everything in that amount of detail, but that's how we're pulling it out. And I wanted to show you a couple of meta-analyses because 
This is ideally what you want to do with the data. You want to put it into, um, you pull all, pull all the studies and actually look at what it tells you. And this one is in the COPD studies, comparing those with COPD with those with controls, um, healthy controls, and it's looking at percentage Harris Benedict. And from this, I don't know if you can see it, um, that's the overall effect. And what that shows is in this particular group, resting energy expenditure is about 14 to 15% higher as a percentage of Harris Benedict in um, COPD patients than it is in control patients. Yes, that's nice. The trouble is we have something here which a lot of people ignore when they interpret um, meta-analyses, something called the I squared statistic. And what that does, it tells you how reliable the results are that you're getting from this meta-analysis, how variable they are. Do they all go in the same direction? And do they all show a similar size effect size? Well, this has an I-squared of 95%, which means no, it doesn't. It means they're going in slightly different directions and the effect size is not the same. So it's an unreliable result. Okay? Now, a lot of people would say, this proves that patients with um, COPD have 50% um, higher predicted Harris-Benedict than controls. This meta-analysis doesn't prove that. It's an indication, but it certainly doesn't prove that. And there's a couple more uh, uh, meta-analyses, one looking at, uh, the top one looking at energy expenditure in cows per day in COPD versus controls, and resting energy expenditure in cows per kilogram fat-free mass in COPD and controls. And in both of you, you can see the little triangle, at the, the diamond at the bottom is showing a higher um, energy expenditure in COPD patients. But in the top um, meta-analysis, the I-squared is 85%, so it's not a reliable result. And you can quite clearly see there, some of them cross the line that way, some of them cross the line that way, some of them are that wide, there's confidence intervals, and some of them are that wide. They are not reliable. However, if you look at the bottom one, it's a very clear result. And that is looking at resting energy expenditure, cows per kilogram fat-free mass is significantly higher and reliably significantly higher in COPD patients compared with controls. That is the only reliable result I can give you today as an example of what we're looking at. But that puts up a question. Um, in clinical practice, how many of you routinely measure body composition in your COPD patients? And if we are making a recommendation on behalf of Pen Group, should we be making a recommendation that, yes, you should be doing that because that's the most reliable way of measuring or, or estimating requirements in this population? Or should we think, no, nope, most people haven't got that, so we won't be recommending it? And that is one thing I want people to pull out in the peer review. And I'm going to make a plea at the end of this for anyone who wants to help peer review it to contact me because that's the sort of question we want some comments on. So I know I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm going to very briefly talk about what we've done with <coughs> nitrogen. Um, I'm not going to go into protein balance, but I'm just going to remind you of what the current PEN guidelines are. They're extremely ancient. We haven't changed them for about 20 years. Um, they were based on um, uh, Professor Elia's um, work in 1990. So what we've done this time is we've decided to conduct a systematic review of guidelines. And we've used a, a standard methodology that I've given the reference for there. We've searched seven databases as recommended by these authors. And we've so far identified 203 clinical guidelines in more than 20 clinical conditions. And we're at the moment data extracting desperately and pulling that information together. So I can't tell you what the results of that are going to be. All I can give you is a couple of indications of the sorts of things we're finding. So there's a systematic review by Ferry that was done in 2013 where they looked at four databases, but they were comparing two different energy uh, protein provisions in randomized controlled trials because they were trying to find out whether a higher protein provision is better than a standard protein provision. Um, and they were looking at what pr uh, protein requirements, how they varied by clinical condition. Um, but what they didn't do is they didn't find enough evidence to be able to do a meta-analysis, 
because the literature was um, very variable and didn't present results in the same way, similar to what we found for energy. So their conclusion was there was very limited availability of high-level evidence, and I suspect we might find that as we go through the guidelines. I'm just going to skip that one. Um, the only thing I would say is, from what we've read so far, it seems that there is very little to be gained in giving more than 0.2 grams of nitrogen per kilogram body mass. Um, and we do know that when people are critically ill, um, giving uh, lots and lots of nitrogen is not beneficial because they just pee it all out. And it's better to give them more nitrogen when they're in the anabolic and recovery phase. So the important point is to recognise when they're getting better. And so we will probably put something in, like we have actually already, something in about how to recognise by patients getting better and becoming anabolic, so that's when you give them more nitrogen. Um, the other thing that we're going to be looking at is um, whether the protage study, which was um, guidelines written, European guidelines, that um, increased the protein um, recommendations for older sick people compared to what generally has been accepted, and we're actually critically, critically reviewing that as well at the moment because they make some quite firm recommendations around what older people might need in terms of protein if they're unwell and also if they're fit, uh, fit and well. So, for example, the sorts of things that we've been seeing in uh, uh, NICE guidelines and Aspen guidelines, again, we've got a wide range of what the recommendations are for what might be a standard slightly metabolically stressed sort of person like the guy that I've um, been talking about throughout for of between one, uh, 0.8 and 2 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. And that makes a big difference. That's the difference between 52 and 130 grams of protein a day. That's a massive... So clinical judgment here is really, really crucial. So I'm just going to finish up by saying when you do a guideline development process, um, one thing you have to think about is how it's going to be disseminated, how it's going to be used, and how you're going to evaluate the impact of what it had. And I've been involved in um, a set of, two sets of guidelines. Um, one was the Intercollegiate Stroke Working Party guidelines a few years ago, um, where we were involved in the nutrition part of that. And I was very impressed by that because they thought right from the outset about how that information that they put together in the guideline was going to be disseminated to clinicians and how it was going to be disseminated to patients and carers. And also they de designed um, um, national audits to audit how well people were complying with the guidelines. Very well thought out way of doing guidelines. I was more recently involved with some ESPEN guidelines where that didn't happen. We just wrote them and they were out in the ether. I won't tell you which ones they are. But that's made me think about how we disseminate what we do with this, assuming we've got something useful to say. So obviously um, this uh, chapter will be um, published in the new handbook um, in March. And as I said, we will be sending out for peer review um, in early to mid-December, so if anyone wants to peer review it, please contact me and my email address is at the end. Um, after we've done this, we will be writing it up as a guideline development paper and would like to publish it in a peer-reviewed journal. And also, I've got this little dream at the back of my mind, which I've talked to about a few people, about running a course that actually underpins what we've been doing and what we've been talking about over the last year. And I would actually like people to register their interest with us because before I run a course, or before we run a course, we'd like to know if people would be interested in attending or not, and how long you might want to attend for and what sort of things, um, how much you might be able to pay for it because that's obviously quite important. So finally, um, I want to reiterate, estimated requirements are only an estimate and they're a starting point only and your clinical judgment and monitoring are essential. We have taken a systematic approach to identify, collate, and review the clinical studies and guidelines in this area, so I'm hoping that what we come up with will be as scientifically robust as we can possibly make it. We will be presenting the data, giving you a choice of different methods to use. Not Henry, not stress factors. 
That's all I can tell you at the moment. Um, so what I want you to think about is when you, if you do peer review is how practical is what we provide you with in clinical practice? Is it useful? Um, and the final recommend thing I want to just say is um, it's our own individual responsibility to ensure our practice is supported by the evidence. And I would say never blindly follow guidelines, even ours and critically appraise all the evidence you ever encounter because no matter what level it is and what experts are involved, it could always be flawed. And my final slide is to give my heartfelt thanks to these five people who have been absolutely brilliant for the past year, put in hours and hours and hours and hours and um, put up with me buying not very many sandwiches because I can't count <laughs> um, and have been absolutely brilliant and I would like to thank you all very much. Well thank you very much Liz for all of the hard work you've done and lasting an hour's presentation which seemed to go very quickly. <laughs> I'm sure you're ready for coffee. However, we do have some time for some questions, if anyone has any questions they would like to ask. That, that was an absolutely excellent presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a quick pro, uh, question on nitrogen, really. Yeah. Um, last year at Baypen, we had a session at the end called Clinical Nutrition Room 101, hmm. where we had a panel of experts who could put anything they absolutely hated from clinical nutrition into room 101. Yeah. And we had a pharmacist, Richard Smith, who works with B. Braun, and the thing he wanted to put in was the conversion factor for nitrogen to protein of 6.25. Yeah. He said it was utter nonsense because it was based on one particular amino acid blend from, <laughs> from uh, parenteral nutrition development ba way back in the 60s. It didn't apply to any of the modern amino acid blends and was certainly nonsense if you were thinking about dietary protein, which mm. could have all number of different amino acids in it. Um, so, uh, kind of three points to the question. Do you, do you agree that that conversion factor is nonsense? What are you going to use in your new guidelines? And <laughs> what would you advise us to do if we're looking at papers talking about nitrogen and we want to convert it to okay. protein? Well, I'm obviously not as skilled and knowledgeable as that pharmacist, but I would probably agree that it does need to be put in room 101. It is an out of date formula. We are going to be quoting protein requirements, not nitrogen requirements. Um, and we are going to make some comments on the quality of the protein and digestibility and pulsing and that sort of thing as well, because we have found some studies on those. Um, so those are the things we're going to include in that. And I've forgotten your third question. I think you've covered it, actually. Oh, right, that's um, all right then. <laughs> I'm certainly relieved to hear you talking in. In protein, protein and, absolutely, um, yeah. I did notice that nitrogen slipped in there. I had tried to take it out of all of my slides, but I did realise halfway through that it had nitrogen in there. We are going to be talking about protein. And certainly those of us that work with PN, though, will still have all the bags yes. specified in nitrogen. So yeah, I think it's just uh, yeah. we need to take that conversion factor with yeah. an element of caution. Yeah, but I don't know what the appropriate one is now. I, I think there's a, a different work. one from each amino acid yeah. blend is what he yeah. was saying. So maybe you need to go to your go manufacturer to your and say, I need to know the one for yeah. this particular yeah. amino acid blend. But then you have to remember that as with the energy requirements, the protein requirements are an estimate. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, getting hung uh, up on something like Starting point and use clinical yeah. judgment yeah. is... Uh, getting hung up on that is exactly, probably yeah. not, not clinically <laughs> worthwhile. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Hi, my name's Julie. I'm from Home Tube Feeding in Bristol. Yes. So one of my pleas without any course really is that the lifelong burden of enteral nutrition falls in the community. Um, and very often any courses that we go on or any information sort of stops at the hospital door and then you're left with the, the monitoring and the clinical application and thinking, you know, I'm feeding half what the requirements would be and yeah. feeling on dodgy ground with that, but knowing I can't feed more. So if there is a course that's run, it would be really good to have that sort of longer continuity Definitely. Part that's particularly why we've put that extra question in. So we are looking at the evidence around that. There isn't a lot there, to be absolutely honest, and it does all focus on energy and doesn't tell us about if they've got lower energy requirements, whether they also have lower protein and micronutrient requirements, because that's what we would like to know. But we haven't actually found very much out there. 
But if we were to run a course, I am now at the moment doing a lot of work in the community and a research project. I am totally community focused, so the course would definitely include that. <laughs> Not at the expense of acute, of course. Thank you very much. So that rounds off the first session this morning.